1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who were protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even through now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice you greatly rejoice with inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Amen. All right, y'all may be seated. Amen. Thank you, brother. Good morning. If you've not already done so, you should open your Bibles to the book of First Peter. It's towards the end. You go to Revelation, which is the last book in your Bible. You just flip back a short period. You'll find yourself in First Peter. And uh, just as you do that, Caleb mentioned that we're starting a new series through the book of First Peter. This is our first sermon. Today will be an overview sermon. We'll try and get the big picture of the book. But I wanted to put uh, before you what this is a little bitty piece of paper that you could call a sermon card. That's how it's labeled. And all it is, is basically a schedule of which texts in 1 Peter are planned. We'll see what the Lord does. This is how I've planned it to be preached on what Sunday. Why would you want to know that? The answer is, you would be really well served to read the text, pray through it before Sunday morning. So that by the time Sunday morning rolls around, you're already looking at next week, Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, you're already familiar with them. You've already read them. You've already prayed through those things and steeped your soul in that part of God's Word so that when you're listening to the sermon, uh, you've got some baseline familiarity and your heart has already been stirred. If you don't already do something like that, uh, I think it's a practice that you would find edifying. You'd find it beneficial. You ought to try it. So there's a whole bunch of these on that black table over there. They're small. They're white in green shapes up here, okay, just so you can find them. They're right over there next to Willie uh, on the black table. You should pick one up, stick it on your fridge, stick it in your Bible, and uh, make good use of it. Well, before we dig into the whole book of 1 Peter, I just want to engage in a little thought experiment with you, and here is the gist of it. What if your life became characterized by ungodly people in your life having power over you? They were in charge. What if the bad guys, however you define that, were in control? Maybe an example. What if you were a woman in a marriage to a husband who was admittedly not a Christian and also not very nice to you? Now, there's a lot of very nice, so to speak, non-Christian folks, but this guy's not nice. He puts clamps on how you spend your money. You're not free to decide on what goes in the little blocks on your calendar. You lose some control. And the question I want to ask you is, how would you respond? How should you respond? Or you could switch the example and you could say, what if you got a new boss at work? You've been at this company for 20 years. They bring in a new supervisor, your direct supervisor from the outside. You finally get to meet the person. He seems a little rough around the edges. And then when you finally meet him, your fears are confirmed. He seems like a power-hungry egomaniac whose strategy, his leadership strategy, is to rule with an iron fist over all the little people like you. That's a tough situation. How would you respond? How would you hope to respond? Or maybe it's government. Maybe that resonates more with you. What if 
Over the next few election cycles, worse and worse candidates are elected and installed into the Oval Office. What if the Supreme Court is packed with justices who believe in an evolving constitution and the administrative state grows and swells and bloats larger than it already is? What if evil is legalized? What if good is criminalized? And you're living under an increasingly ungodly authority. What if Christians begin to receive financial penalties? What if preaching the gospel is branded as hate speech? How would you respond? How would you respond if bad people, so to speak, gain control over your life, whether a husband, whether a boss, whether government, and you could multiply other examples? What would be on your list to hope that you would respond? How would you hope to respond? How would you hope to conduct yourself? When the Apostle Peter wrote this letter, 1 Peter, that's what we call it, his first letter, about 2,000 years ago, the Christians who received the letter were facing all these kinds of situations and worse. They're the folks who got the letter. They had unbelieving slave masters, Chapter 2, some of them were very harsh. In case you missed it, the Christians were the slaves. Some of the women had husbands who resented that their wives had become Christians. When they got married, they weren't Christians. And now the the wife has become a Christian. And so these husbands thought their wives had brought shame on their families by abandoning the reputable gods that they had worshipped. Their family harmony was fractured. The government at the time was certainly not a democratically elected government set up to restrain the sinful hearts of men by checks and balances and by separation of powers. They didn't have any of that stuff. The corrupt minions of those in charge regularly delighted in coercing and extorting God's people. This was all standard fare. In other words, the Christians who received Peter's letter were dealt a situation in life that is almost certainly worse than what you imagined in our thought experiment. So, that begs the question, doesn't it? I said, how would you hope to respond? What would life be like? The question that is begged is, what did Peter have to say to these suffering Christians? What would he say? What did he, under the inspiration of God himself, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, want them to know? What did he want them to keep at the top of their mind? to be sure not to forget in the face of trials and suffering. Now, it's not lost on me that there are some people in the room today, for sure, who have situations similar to what I've just described. Broken marriages, difficult work situations, etc. And there are other examples. In the room, you have those situations. I said, what would it be like? And you might say, it is like that for me. That's my day-to-day. That's how I live. Right? There's also probably people in the room who live with a deep and controlling fear that situations like the ones I've been mentioning will come rolling in and crashing on you like a thunderstorm, ruining your life, stealing your joy. A fear. So we don't need to only get theory about how to do good counseling for hurting people. We need to be the patients. We need to know what God would have to say to us We need to learn to think God's thoughts about being mistreated. Even the small little injustices that come to us really ruffle our feathers. If you've not suffered yet in any significant way, if you're a Christian, it will come. Right? Paul told Timothy that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And I'm not only talking about the more severe forms of persecution. I'm talking about people just don't like you. Smaller things, which does seem to be much of what was happening to those who received 1 Peter. We need to learn how God thinks, how he wants us to think instead of imbibing the world's thoughts from the talking heads who never help you view the world through the revelation of Scripture, ever. They never help you cling tight to God's promises. They never direct you on the sure paths of holy conduct. We need to hear what God has to say about being mistreated about what's happening in your life now or what may happen in the future. What to do when you're disliked for being a Christian. 
how to maximize your joy in Christ and live in light of eternity. We need God's help. So let's pray and ask him to help us. Father, this very letter tells us, Peter commands them, be holy like the one who called you. And then he grounds the command from Leviticus where you said, you shall be holy for I am holy. Lord, that's your command, divine, from heaven, non-negotiable, full of authority to the people of Cross Point Baptist Church. You shall be holy, for I am holy. We're to be like you. Father, we confess that we have fallen short of that in so many ways. We, we look too much like the world. We live and love too much like the world. God, forgive us. We don't want to be a worldly people. We don't want to be a not consecrated, not set apart, just like the world, hearts not moved when they ought to be people. So we confess that we've gone astray in various ways. We also confess that we've been redeemed, not with perishable things like money. Our price was not paid merely by money but with precious blood, that was the payment, that was the exchange, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Thank you, Father, for the blood of Christ who, who bridges the gap between people like us who are not holy and people like you who are holy. Thank you that his blood receives the full penalty for the forgiveness of our sins that we had earned. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, that we can confess our sins not as rejected ones, but as your children who've gone astray and whom you love. Thank you for this church, Lord. Failing as we are, weak as we are. Thank you for the small groups that meet. Thank you for the one that meets at Mr. Dana's house. Thank you for Greg who leads them. Would you continue to bless them? We hear, I hear ways of which these folks are encouraged by meeting together, would you continue to multiply it? Just like Jesus multiplied the loaves, would you multiply encouragement? Use regular, ordinary people to do great things in the lives of each other. Thank you that we are not the only church. Thank you, Lord. God forbid. Thank you for Trinity Church Southside in Southside, Virginia, and their elders, Corey and Hunter. Thank you for these men, Lord. Would you make their love for Christ burn hot? Make them holy cause the testimony of their church, their congregation, that faith family, to be a bright, shining witness for the glory of Christ. Cause them to grow in holiness. Bless them, Lord. Thank you for the spread of the gospel far and wide. Thank you for this family that we have prayed for uh, in December, in Southeast Asia. Husband, wife, three kids. Lord, would you continue to bless them? Boots on the ground, all the culture shock. Goodness, hard to imagine. Lord, would you bless them? Cause them to know you're with them. Cause them to walk out that hymn we just sang, Jesus strong and kind. When they're weak, come to you. When they're scared, come to you. Lord, bless them that way. Help them, sustain them. Thank you for the Reese family. Thank you that uh, Bob continues to labor on in Uganda. Lord, bless this man. Cause his mission to be fruitful. Cause Christ to be exalted. Lord, we thank you that... Uh, even thinking through thought experiments about government and wicked government, you tell us to pray for those in authority. So it's our joy as a church this morning to pray for our state legislature, the lawmakers of Tennessee. Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come, your will would be done, that these folks would turn away from sin. People in suits and tie would be on their knees confessing the name of Christ and that you would bless them. You would cause them to do their job in a way that pleases you. And for ourselves, Lord, we need help looking at a book like this. We need help. Cause the suffering of Christ and his silence before his persecutors to so captivate our hearts that we would be forever changed. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, what we're going to do first is I'm just going to say a few things by way of orientation and overview. The first one is that because this is an overview sermon, I'm going to be referencing quite a lot of different passages, and I'm going to use some shorthand. And the way I do it, so just so you won't be confused, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to do that. 
So here's an example. When I refer to the fourth chapter and the sixth verse, I'm just going to say 4, 6. Or when I refer to the second chapter and the third verse, I'm going to say 2, 3. Okay? Or you could come at it from the other angle and you could say, when I say 419, I mean chapter 4, verse 19. All right? All clear, just so you don't get lost? Because I'm going to mention a bunch of different verses. You're free to flip around if that's helpful to you, but I won't always mention the verses, so you might not be able to find them. So flip, if, flip at your own risk, if you will. <laughs> we need to remember, by way of overview, who received the letter. They're mostly Gentiles. That means non-Jews living in modern-day Turkey. If you don't know where Turkey is, to its, see if I can get this right for you, to its... West is Europe, and to its east is the Promised Land, okay? So it's in between Europe and Asia, basically, large landmass. It's right on top of the Mediterranean Sea, okay? Big, giant landmass. And above Turkey is the Black Sea. You should just look on, uh, on a map sometime where Turkey is. Verse 1 names the places, the regions as they were called then, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Okay, so they're mostly Gentiles, maybe a few Jews, but mostly non-Jews, and living in modern-day Turkey. We learn in chapter 4, verse 3, or 4, 3, that they're mostly Gentiles. They were born worshiping Greek gods, probably, and they've turned to put their faith in Christ. In other words, they're converts from paganism. This almost certainly, as I alluded to earlier, has a great deal to do with why they're suffering. They've abandoned their paganism. They've abandoned their Greek gods. You can read in the book of Acts. It's not a popular thing to do back in the day. They got all out of shape when anybody disrespected the Greek goddess Athena. And these folks have forged deep and permanent fissures in their social circles. They're paying the social cost of becoming Christians. And that's probably the most important thing to remember about them as we get oriented to the letter. They're suffering. They're suffering. In chapter 4, Peter refers to the, quote, fiery ordeal among them. Would we like to have a fiery ordeal among us? That's what they were experiencing. In chapter 1, he tells them that their, quote, various trials are something like putting gold in a hot, hot furnace that looks pure, but you can't tell until you put it in the furnace, and the heat of that furnace burns out all the impurities. They melt and ooze away from the gold. The only thing left is the gold. Peter says, that's your experience. You're like that. You're the gold. The trials that you're experiencing are the fire. Chapter 2, he tells them that they are suffering unjustly. They don't deserve to be treated the way that they are. Chapter 3, he says, and you should try and wrap your mind around this, it is God's will that some of you are suffering even though you did everything right. God's will. In 419, he tells them the same thing. They are suffering, quote, according to the will of God. And then in chapter 5, he tells them that sufferings are common to Christians. There are other Christians elsewhere suffering in the world just like they are. They're not the only ones. But they're suffering. You can hear Peter's emphasis, right? He's repeating it over and over and over. You're suffering. These are suffering people. We should ask, what kind of suffering? Suffering is an umbrella term. What kind of suffering? There's more than one type of suffering, isn't there? Cancer is suffering. Depression is suffering. Economic downturn is suffering. An invading nation is suffering. None of those are what Peter is talking about in this letter. Those are very important. They're not what Peter's talking about. Chapter 2 Verse 19 says that these folks are suffering unjustly. In other words, they're being persecuted. The type of suffering they're experiencing is persecution. They're not suffering merely under the strain and weight of a broken and warped created order that produces such evils as diabetes and chronic fatigue syndrome. Those are very important, very legitimate sufferings. Not what 1 Peter's about. These people are hated. They're singled out. They're intentionally mistreated. They're singled out in chapter 2 by their slave masters. They're viewed as the scum of the world. 
They're viewed as a blight on an otherwise beautiful landscape. For example, chapter 3, verse 17 says that they, quote, suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. It's the doing what is right that's the cause of their suffering. That sounds so crazy, doesn't it? I thought if you do good, you would get rewarded. And Peter said, it's all that doing good that's getting you in trouble with everybody out there. The world hates it when Christians refuse to join in in certain wicked things, because it shines the spotlight of the holiness of God on evil people doing grimy things. It shows their guilt. So if you imagine two men in a dark alley, clothed in black, shadows all around, doing a drug deal, and somebody on the inside flicks on a light, and now they're exposed. It's kind of what happens when Christians live good lives, full of integrity, honesty, and refuse to partake in the evil things that the Lord rejoices in. So they're being persecuted. So let me ask you another question. If you had some friends, let's say, God, make this happen. A few years from now, God sends some missionaries from this church to go to some place where there is no gospel. And then they're sending us correspondences back. And they're telling us, it's actually not going so well. No one's listening to our message. And the people really don't like us. They really don't like the good news we're trying to tell them out of the Bible. And it's getting hard to get somebody to come over and fix our dishwasher. They don't want to come and do it. Right? They're starting to be persecuted. If you wrote them a letter, what would you put in it? What would you write to people who are experiencing what Peter calls a fiery ordeal? Think about it. Think of an example. I won't ask you to say it out loud. Maybe you'd want to comfort them. Encourage them. Search for some words that would help dull the pain and compassion. Maybe give them a light of hope in the darkness they feel. What did Peter say to those people? Our sermon's going to be a little different than usual today. Normally, we like to hone in on a smaller number of verses. But we're going to try today to zoom way, 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 way out, like flying in a plane, and you can see the whole landscape from one vantage point. We're looking at the whole forest rather than just the trees or a tree at a time. We're going to try and see what Peter actually did say to these precious people, how Peter answered the question of what he would write in a letter to some suffering or persecuted Christians. And I'm going to suggest to you, if you're taking notes, here's your outline, that Peter tells them four main things. You could categorize it differently, maybe. But these are certainly prominent. Here's the first one. He tells them that they have a new identity. Number two, he tells them to live good lives. They already got in trouble for that. He says, do it some more. Number three, he tells them to embrace suffering as God's will for their lives. We talked about that. And then number four, he tells them to think a lot about the return of Christ. First, their new identity. I'm going to say just a quick word as we, as we dig in about the organization of the book. So if, if you think about Ephesians and Romans, the way that those letters are structured, you have the first chunk of chapters, which is all doctrine. Right? Ephesians we're going through on Wednesday nights. Chapters 1 through 3 are all indicatives. This is what God has done. This is who you are. This is your identity. Statement, statement, statement. No commands. Just statements. And then in Ephesians 4 to 6, you get commands. In other words, the first few chapters tell you what's true, and then the last few chapters tell you how you should live if that's true. First Peter's not like that. It's not as clean. It's not as neat in that way. He's not writing like Paul. This is Peter, remember? Forgive me if I call him Paul. I probably will. Peter wrote the book. And he didn't do it like Paul does it. All the teaching of doctrine is all interwoven and intermingled, tangled up with all the practical instruction like a bird's nest. It all goes together. So we can't quite look at it in terms of breaking it into sections that flow. So instead we'll look at it thematically, looking at prominent themes that are repeated. So that's why 
I made no promises about your ability to follow me as we go through different, <laughs> different themes throughout the whole book. Well, I mentioned that these folks are Gentiles. We're talking about their identity, right? They were born with a Gentile identity, a non-Jew identity. They didn't grow up going to church, so to speak. They didn't grow up going to the synagogue anyways. They maybe grew up going to pagan temples. Their parents took some of their family income and offered it to the pagan deities. They did not grow up with a Christian identity. And Peter tells them many ways in this letter that their identity has undergone a fundamental shift. In one very important sense, they are not who they used to be. So look at the very first sentence. He calls them, according to the NASB, aliens. Now that sounds weird to us. Another translation says exiles. He's not talking about you know, UFOs and stuff. More like illegal aliens or sojourners or exiles. They're not at home. They used to be right at home in Pontus and Cappadocia. And Peter says you don't really belong there. They used to go down to, to the street, down the street to go to the market, and they still go there with all the bread and the fish and everything they needed, all their produce. But it used to feel like home, and now they feel like an exile living in a foreign land. They should, anyways. Peter says that they are exiles, just like the Israelites of old were carried away in exile by Babylon and Assyria as slaves and exiles. Right? They wanted to get back to the promised land, but they were living elsewhere under the thumb of an ungodly government. And so in a very important sense, the Christians who received First Peter no longer belonged to the world as their fundamental home. They had a heavenly home. They were citizens of a different kingdom, and their identity has changed. Now, I told you he says a lot of things. He calls them newborn babies. It's a metaphor, of course. He tells them they're like redeemed or liberated slaves. He tells them that they're like obedient children. I mean, he's a lot of identities that Peter is unfolding to these folks. But the main point, the umbrella term that makes it all fit together, is that through Jesus, these Gentiles, formerly not God's people, once separated from their maker, through Jesus have now become the people of God. This is their new fundamental and primary identity. And Peter does this in some surprising, kind of shocking ways. So in 116, Peter takes an Old Testament passage like Leviticus 11.44, which I've already mentioned, that says, You shall be holy, for I am holy, which was written to whom? The Jews. We're talking about Leviticus, right? Think Moses. Think Sinai. Think wandering around in the wilderness, the covenant people after the Exodus. Originally, in Leviticus 11, God says, You, Jews, out in the wilderness shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter quotes that. 1,400 years later, and he says to these former Gentiles, You must be holy as God is holy. You are the people of God. He does something just like that in 1, 18 and 19. He says that they were redeemed with blood as of a lamb that's spotless and clean. Where's that come from? Where is this redemption by an innocent and spotless victim? Well, of course, that comes similarly from the Torah. That comes from the Old Testament, from places like Leviticus, Exodus. Who was to be redeemed in that way? Have their penalty paid in that way? The Jews. In other words, the people of God. But these are Gentiles, right? And Peter does this kind of thing many different ways, where he takes these truths that God has applied to his people and says, you Gentiles are the people of God. You are his covenant people. You're in the new covenant. You're no longer, as far as your identity goes, fundamentally out there somewhere away from God in the world of sin and the judgment to come. No, no. You have a new identity in Christ. Now listen to me. That matters a lot to suffering Christians. Because they're God's people, God is not unaware of their suffering. He knows the sorrows of his own dear children. Consider how Exodus unfolds. He hears their cry, and he comes and with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm rescues them. You are his people. He sees your persecutions, just like ancient Pharaoh persecuted your spiritual forefathers. Your suffering is not an accident. You're hated because you're a Christian. Your identity is the cause of your suffering. 
and a deep comfort in your suffering. God is attending to you. He cares for you. He says in chapter 2, you're a chosen race. That's the Gentiles. You think that would be the Jews? You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, Gentiles, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That's all language out of places like Exodus 19. Who's a people for God's own possession except Israel? And the Gentiles who received 1 Peter, right? They're God's people. The world rejected Christ, but he had all of God's favor. So the world rejects you, but you have, like him, all of God's favor. You are his people. You have a new identity. If you're here today and you're a Christian, you have a fundamental identity. I don't know what your parents told you. I don't know what the TV you watch tells you or the earbuds you stick in your ears tell you. Your identity is in Christ. That's who you are. More fundamental than whatever else somebody else or you yourself like to tack on top of that. You're God's people. There's much more meaning in that than anything else. So when suffering comes, you remember to whom you belong. That's Peter's first major theme. The second is he tells them to live good lives. Now, that should surprise you if you have some sensitivity to the situation and how people are. That might surprise you. I, in fact, I don't think when I asked you to make your mental list of what you would put on your, or in your letter to some suffering missionaries from our church three years from now, I don't bet many of you said, be holy, live good lives, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. I don't think any of you put that in there. Don't raise your hand if you did, but I don't think there's very many. But for Peter, it's a major theme. He just keeps right on banging this drum throughout the whole letter. It comes up repeatedly. He's concerned about their conduct. He's concerned about their reputation with the world outside, in their communities, with their unbelieving associates, with their unbelieving slave masters and husbands and the government. They're not to be a two-faced people, putting on one face when they show up to church and another face at the bar with the boys. No, you are to be holy through and through, no matter where you are. Be holy, God says, for I am holy. Peter keeps beating the drum in 2.12. Keep your behavior excellent, excellent among the Gentiles. There's a public reputation at stake. In 3.16, he tells them, keep a good conscience. And he emphasizes the necessity of good behavior. He goes on, pardon me, to speak how they should conduct themselves in relation to the government, as I mentioned, slave masters, unbelieving husbands, Etc. Why? Why? Why did Peter put that on his list? Make sure you live good lives, you suffering, persecuted Christians. Doesn't it seem a little heavy handed? I said it maybe would surprise you. I mean, maybe some would say, cut them some slack, Peter. My goodness, is this really the time? Why are you concerned with checking in on their holiness when they're being persecuted? Chased like lambs across the field as the snapping jaws of the lion are after them. Is that really the moment to talk to them about their holiness? Here's the basic answer that Peter gives as you read the text. He has a strategy, he has a reason. He wants to pull the rug out from underneath their persecutors. What do I mean by that? The persecutors would love nothing more than to find these Christians who say they care about holiness guilty of murder, thievery, evildoing, or meddling, 415, chapter 4, verse 15, and to use those sins as a means of discrediting the gospel. Peter knows this about suffering, persecuted Christians. Her unbelieving husband, a lady in the church, would love to say, look at those Christians. They're no different than the world. They're nothing but hypocrites with all their Jesus talk. Peter knows. Peter wants to give the world no occasion to make that kind of slander, no fodder for the tabloids. He wants to pull the rug out from under the persecutors. He wants to pull the bullets out from all of their guns, no smearing the gospel on the, because of the church's behavior. So I'll give you an example in 2.12, just one example. I mentioned this one before, but let me give you the whole verse. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. We said that. Why? So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, 
glorify God in the day of visitation. What does that mean? Maybe you can imagine the final day of judgment when all people stand before the living God, men, women, boys, girls, as the Lord Jesus Christ sits on what Revelation calls a great white throne and every single person hauls in all of their deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, lays them all on the table. The omniscient, all-seeing, flaming eyes of the Lord Jesus sifts through them all to give the flawless judgment. That's the day of visitation, when Jesus comes back and every man faces the judgment of God. Can you imagine those men from Bithynia or Cappadocia who dishonestly slandered these Christians being forced to eat their words on that day because of the good conduct of Christians? That's what Peter's talking about. Can you imagine the slanderers in that way, to use Peter's language, glorifying God in the day of visitation, being forced to admit that they had lied about God's people as God himself publicly vindicates them all to the whole world. That's what Peter wants. Peter wants the truth of the gospel credited as true, believed, not slandered. And the way you live has a great deal to do with how that process unfolds. He wants the evidence from your life to stack up in favor of the beauty of King Jesus. To not put it in preachy talk, he wants you to live in such a way so that people will say, there is a God in heaven, his son Jesus is precious. And there's no other explanation for how that could be based on how this person chooses to live their life. And as we see, especially contextually in the book of 1 Peter, how this person patiently bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. The slave master looks at the slave, mistreats him, and the slave returns kindness to him. There's no explanation apart from the kindness of Christ coming from Christ through his people in a way that the world doesn't understand. Peter wants these Christians to live like that. He emphasizes in his letter many times the necessity of living good lives. That's our second theme. The third thing Peter tells them is that their suffering is God's will for their lives. It emerges, that theme does, early in the letter. You know, in the springtime, the daffodils come out first, at least close to first, and they tell you, ah, springtime has arrived. Something like that happens in a lot of these letters, and it happens in this letter. You get this initial appearance as the shoot bursts out of the dirt in this case, related to suffering and it being God's good plan for his people, telling you what's going to come the rest of the letter, just like you know the springtime has arrived. So look at verse 6, if you have your Bible. The very beginning, the sixth verse of the whole letter. You need, you need this. You need to see it. He's talking about persecution. He's talking about the salvation that will be revealed to them. And then in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, that salvation, even though now, for a little while, here's the words that I wanted to point out, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Necessary. That theme shows up over and over again, the necessity of suffering the fact that it's God's will that they suffer. Not just that they suffer, but that it's God's will that they suffer. Shows up many times in 1 Peter. He mentions it again in 2.18, where he urges these household servants or slaves to submit, not only when their masters are good to them, because that's easy, right? But when they're harsh to them, unreasonable to them, you still submit to them. That's what Peter tells them. There's nothing particularly noble about doing something wrong and getting caught red-handed and then patiently enduring the treatment. No, you, you're getting what you deserve. That's what Peter says there in chapter 2. But what if you did everything right, like I said before? What if the taskmaster gave you a list, a checklist, to do all the things, and you did them all and you got done, and he reprimands you and harshly treats you? 
How you respond then says a lot about whether or not you really believe Jesus is risen from the dead. Peter says, you bear up under sorrows because you have God seeing everything. Respond to that slave master who's doing wrong in a way that he can't explain. Peter says, endure with patience this impossible command. We don't like that. I know you have that experience. I have that experience where you feel like you've been unfairly treated. Something, someone kind of did you wrong. It's not my fault. And then you go home, and if you're like me, you play it over and over in your mind, trying to you can replay the conversation, trying to persuade yourself. You're, you're all of a sudden the jury and the judge and the executioner in your own mind, declaring them guilty, declaring yourself innocent, right? This is not fair. This is not right. This is wrong. It's an impossible command, isn't it? When someone treats you wrongly, to respond to them in a way that is full of kindness and generosity and tender-hearted goodness. <laughs> With an impossible command must come Enabling power to do the impossible. That's exactly what Peter gives them. So just after he's told the slaves, Christian slaves, to be submissive to their ungodly masters, he launches in 221 to one of the most beautiful descriptions of the suffering of Christ in the whole Bible. It is the power or fuel that they need to fulfill the impossible command. If you know what it feels like to be unfairly treated, Jesus knows it too. He had done nothing wrong, either in deed or in word, Peter said. Committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet, he was reviled. The good man was hated. He was made to drink the cup of suffering from the hands of men who could pin nothing on him for wrongdoing, and they said, drink it anyways. How did he respond? I mean, surely if we hate being treated unjustly because it seems unjust, it should seem infinitely more unjust for that man to be treated unjustly, right? How did he respond? He was submissive to them. Even to the lowlifes and the scoundrels, like Isaiah 53 says, like a little lamb led to the slaughter is silent and doesn't open his mouth. You can see the lamb, right, walking along to be slaughtered, not resisting, not bleeding, not fighting, not pulling against the rope, just quietly coming right along. Peter says the Lord Jesus was like that, submitting on purpose. They didn't get the better of him. He was submitting on purpose to his persecutors. He, to use Peter's language, kept on entrusting himself to his heavenly father. He knew that the men didn't control his destiny. He knew that his heavenly father controlled his destiny. And so he submitted to these evil, evil deeds. Hear, household slaves. Hear, wives with unbelieving husbands. Here's your power to obey the impossible command. You know what it looks like when you're walking on the beach, maybe, and there's footsteps and you walk, you put your feet in each footstep on the beach like that. You follow the path. It's kind of fun to make your feet match. Peter says, that's what Jesus did for you. 221. He left for you an example to follow in his steps. When you're unjustly treated, you remember that Jesus went first. He walked the path first. And you are following in his footsteps on that path. Come and follow me, he says, even in this, my little lambs. But Peter does give more, more ammunition, more ability to endure suffering patiently. I said in the beginning of this point that it's God's will that they suffer. I mentioned in 221, he says there that they were called for this purpose. Goodness gracious, you should look at that verse. Chapter 2, verse 21, about suffering. This is just after the slaves are told to endure patiently mistreatment. 2.21, for you have been called for this purpose. 
since Christ also suffered for you, leaving for you an example to follow in his steps. Or in 317, Peter says that God would even will it to be so, that they would suffer for doing right. I don't know if you know the God who wills such things. Do you know him that way? When you say God, what comes into your mind? Someone who would will, who would plan his people to suffer for doing right? I heard many times a former pastor of mine say, reading the Bible is the best way to blow up your theology. Do you know him? Would he will for you to suffer for doing right? First Peter says so. Time would fail me if I mentioned all the times Peter says something like that. But in 4.12, he tells them not to be surprised at the fiery ordeal among them, as though some strange thing were happening to them. In other words, Peter says, what did you expect? Didn't you see this coming? And then in chapter 4, again in verse 19, it's something like, of the whole letter, the grand finale at the fireworks show. That's what 4, 419 is. He says, quote, Those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing good. Notice the text says they're suffering according to the will of God. Now, I'm asking you again, was this on the list, your imaginary list, of things that you would have put in the letter to send to our three years from now persecuted missionaries in Afghanistan was it's God's will that you suffer on your list. Sufferers need to know this. The Holy Spirit thinks sufferers need to know it. Peter says, listen, suffering Christians, you have to know that your suffering is not abnormal. Something has not gone wrong. God has not left his throne. Something's not, something is wrong from a creation standpoint, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God is still looking after you. Your suffering is not an accident or an oversight on the part of God. It is his will for you to suffer like his son suffered. It's God's plan for your life. It's the blueprint. It's in the plans. It's the design. So, when you don't get that promotion that you wanted, maybe it was because you're a Christian, maybe not. Or when you're ostracized by your family or your neighbors give you weird looks for following Christ or at school, on the basketball court, your friends give you a hard time for not drinking with them and partying with them or holding firm to your biblical convictions about sexuality or the exclusivity of Christ. You get called a bigot you get called a hypocrite. All that suffering is, quote, according to the will of God. Peter wants these persecuted Christians to rest in the knowledge, as Jesus before them did, that their persecutions don't ultimately come from the hands of godly men, but they come from the kind hands of a God who has loved them and designed their lives far better than they could have done themselves. Or, to use the metaphor from chapter 1, that Caleb read for us earlier, all the evils that these Christians will receive from the hands of ungodly men will turn out for their benefit because their faith will have been proven genuine. Even through the hottest furnace, the gold will be real gold and not melt away into something else. And there will be for them on that day a better reward, more praise and glory and honor. Or to quote the hymn that we sang a week or two ago, and the calm will be the better for the storms that we endure because of the storms, right? If you're suffering today as a Christian, even in small ways, you should leave here today knowing that you're suffering according to the well and lovingly thought out plan of your heavenly father. And that in the end, none of it, not a drop, will be wasted. It will only serve to amplify your eternal joy in Christ. There's a reward that God has in mind for you. Fourth and finally, he tells them, as I mentioned, to think often about the return of Christ. What do sufferers need to hear? They need to hear that their suffering won't last forever. 
It has a marked out end point. There's a cosmic timer ticking down, which will soon go off. And when it does, all suffering, persecutions, all suffering, in this context, persecutions, will be over forever. So if you imagine, not trying to be funny, the pain of a broken nose, you go to the doctor, it's just killing you. And the doctor gives you, for some reason, this, this news that it's going to be just like that. There's no pain medicine that works. You're going to feel that feeling for the next six months. There's nothing they can do. You imagine the misery of thinking that that is going to be your lot. In other words, you now, not, you know, you now have, pardon me, not only physical pain, but also mental anguish attached to your pain with dread and fear of what you're about to experience. Now imagine, otherwise, how different your experience would be if he told you, I can make all that pain go away forever. Give me 30 seconds. Oh, man, that's wind in the sails, right? Our, our experience of suffering is really different when we know that pain has a limited shelf life. It's not going to last. Peter tells them in 1.6 that their trials are, quote, for a little while. He tells them to think about the return of Christ often. 113, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All your hope, fix it on the day when you see Jesus and he puts all this to rest. He tells them that the more they suffer now, the greater will be their joy when Christ is revealed in glory. 413, he mentions the future experience of, quote, partaking of the glory that will soon be revealed, 5.1. I could list more. I won't. Peter cannot let this go. The return of Christ, the end of suffering, and the joy that these precious people will experience for endless eternity, beginning on that day, is coming like a freight train. God is bringing it. There's nothing who can stop it. It's like a general who's who sees his men out on the front lines. The artillery barrage is landing all around them. He gets on the phone. He tells them, listen, the air support is almost there. They're almost there. These guys on the front line can hear the enemy shells exploding all around them, crackling through the air, threatening to crush their very skulls with deafening booms, but it won't last. Christ will come back in the midst of all that. He will put everything to rights. And not only will suffering be over, we will all feel then like we should feel now that it was all worth it. Quote, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Jesus is coming back. 1 Peter 5.10, you're suffering now, but the day is coming when you will see Jesus face to face. All that suffering as a Christian will result in, quote, praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, 1.7. Persecuted Christians and those anticipating persecution like many of you in this room need to know two things. You're suffering whether past, present, or suffering in the future, won't last. It has a non-negotiable, no-fudging-it expiration date. And second, it has a purpose. It has meaning. It will bear fruit. You will be eternally better off for having endured it. When Christ is revealed from heaven, as Paul told the Thessalonians, in flaming fire with all his holy angels, your joy will be compounded. Think, remember I said about the footsteps on the beach? Think about Jesus' pattern. He suffered for a specifically and short delineated time. And he was rewarded for his suffering, Philippians chapter 2. Rewarded for his suffering with invincible resurrection life, life forever, untouchable, and with a people. God crowned him with glory and honor because of his sufferings, for endless eternity, the suffering of all God's people will be rewarded with a prize just like his. He will be our prize, and there'll be more joy, more rejoicing, more honor on that day, the more you suffer. 
The main point of the letter is to tell suffering Christians that despite being used and abused and looked down on by the world, that they are the people of God, fully reconciled to him, brought back to him through the blood of Christ, his own son, and the forgiveness of their sins. And because they belong to a new family and have a new father, they have new household rules. Live the way that pleases your father. But they need to understand that their persecutions won't stop because of their good behavior. Instead, God will work through their good behavior in the midst of persecution, even if and as it continues. Suffering is the will of God for you. But the truly hard parts, genuinely hard, we should weep with those who weep. We don't go hit them with a sovereignty hammer. Those hard parts are not their final destiny, not their permanent station or assignment. The day is coming, Peter says, when all your sorrows and griefs and pains will be swallowed up by the glory of Christ when he returns, and you will have no regrets for staying faithful to Christ. None. The darkness of the night will be cast aside when the sunrise comes forth with its rose-colored rays. Suffering will not last forever. That's a remarkable irony, isn't it? We live our whole life, some of us, and what you see is the people that the world praises and exalts, get all the attention and all the glory. And the people that the world despises are over here. And in the end, on the last day, there's a great reversal, right? You can live for this life or the next. You can't have both. You can choose to associate yourself with Christ or the world. Better to choose suffering with Jesus for a little while than to choose eternal ruin because you wanted a short period of pleasure in the world. God help us. All the hated ones of the world, the little ones, the despised ones, the rejected ones, the world didn't notice or disdain them, will hear from the Lord Jesus in the presence of all the mighty and powerful, well done, good and faithful servants. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I want you to consider the return of Christ. It might sound really weird, like preachy religious talk, but it won't sound weird when he shows up and you see him. The fact of his cross and resurrection will be so blindingly obvious that it won't occur to you anymore to doubt their reality. That would feel absurd looking him straight in the face if you could do so. His infinite authority over all things as the king and judge of the world will fill the atmosphere the way that water covers the sea. There will be no questioning it. It won't even be a question that enters anybody's mind. You should turn away from sin now. Put all your trust in Christ. You can have, like these folks in 1 Peter, a new identity sitting in your chair right now. Turn away from sin and trust him. You just receive from him by trusting all his kindness to you. Church, I remind you that you will see Jesus again much sooner than it feels to you as you go about day by day. You should remember that you are God's people. You should live holy lives, even when it costs you something to do it. You should trust that God's design for your life, not might but will, include suffering. And you should think often about the return of Christ. He's coming back. I'm going to give Peter the last word from chapter 1. Notice that he says, to fix your hope all the way. Not think about it sometimes. Quote, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ.